And this was kind of unique because I, I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't tell him anything. But it's called, the battle is on. <laughs> save yourself. <laughs> we'll see. So in 2 Samuel 18, 6. Look at 18 verse 6. I should have went on a little further. I don't know. <laughs> you ain't going to have that. All right. It's okay. Down to 8. Down to 8. Okay. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim. Verse 7. Where the people of Israel were slain before the servant of David, and there was, there was a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. Verse 8. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. That's kind of a tricky one right there, isn't it? You kind of slip through those things sometimes when you read them. So in this chapter of 2 Samuel, we find that the kingdom of Israel has been divided, and it's been divided between King David and, and his son Absalom. Remember that? If, I don't know if any of you ever watched it. I watched the video. It's a very good video. I'd recommend it. It's called King David. And um, what was that guy that was in it? No. We're not, we're not leaving until we get that name. Huh? I can't hear you. That's it. I got it. I'll give you something later. I'm not sure. you, get, you get the prize. And uh, so Richard Peter, and it was, it was amazingly good. It is an old one, but it'd be worth checking out. And so uh, it was between uh, King David and his son Absalom. Absalom, and, and you know, David loved his son, but there was always turmoil going on in the family. Is there, you know, that sometimes we can relate to that. And so there was a, a great battle that, that came about. It engaged because of this division that was taking place. And the devil, uh, he's got, he's got a, a game plan. Anytime there is confusion or uh, just division that goes on into any household, he wants to cause division in the church and the family. He does. you got to realize that when I say church and the family, that the family, that, that, that's the building block of the church. Without the church, without the family, there's pretty much not going to be a church. But God promised us that he, he is going to have a church. There's no two ways about that. So we got to come into unity. And, and when, so when I, last week I spoke about, um, I know what I spoke about. Do you know what I spoke about? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going out of the ministry and be careful. Exactly. You're going out of the ministry and be careful. But it was I, I I did a mission impossible with you. You remember? Yes. And I and I asked you, I said, if you choose to accept this mission, then beware that there is if this is supposed to be an impossible mission. But the Bible says to go out, he commissions us. See, so get that commission, mission, commission. Us to go into the highways and the byways everywhere and compel them to come in. Amen? Amen. Now that looked impossible. That kind of looks impossible. I'm going to tell you what I think is switching here. I, got, I came up with another kind of concept here. I've got some um, inspiration, reading some stuff, got some inspiration about it. And, but the mission that is, we are supposed to accomplish this. Is, this is the mission. And Jesus said in Mark uh, 3.25, he says this. This is what we got we to gotta be careful within our own body. It is that if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. We have to be in one in unity. So listen, church, we, we have a mission. I spoke of it last week, and I'm telling you, we have a mission, and we can accomplish that mission. The Bible tells us that... that we just read that there's 20,000 men were slain because of division in the kingdom of Israel. 20,000. Israel men. But notice what the Bible says in verse 8. But notice what the Bible says in verse 8. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Are we in Mark? Mark 3? Here we go. But notice what the Bible says in verse 8. Here we go. For the Bible, I mean, for the battle was there 
scattered over the face of all the country. And the wood, and listen, and the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. More people died that day because of the surroundings than those that were killed by the sword or the, of the enemy. More. Now I'm getting ready to get into it. I'm getting ready to show you something. As we read the scriptures, I don't think that uh, it's hard to, you know, not to see or that this is the same thing that's happening in our world today. And the reason I think that those people are, are, are not coming to God is not because of fighting against God. I just, you know, I just or, or the fact that they don't want to go to God. I don't see that. It's not because, uh, you know, they're not going around saying I. It's not mine, but I mean, it's in general, the world as a whole, they don't really even think about God much. They're not fighting against God. They're not saying, I don't want to be with God. They're not saying they want to be with God. They're just not saying anything much. Am I right? Yes. It's not like where you go, everybody's fighting against you. I mean, we do have some of that happening, and there's, there's, but it's a small percentage compared to the overall world, in a sense. I mean, and especially in the United States. It, the reason that they're not going for God or fighting against God is that because they're entangled in their surroundings. Okay? And when you think about it, everywhere you look, there's something that tries to entangle everybody, including ourselves. We could be tempted as well and entangled in these situations, whether it be money, lust, pride. Don't tell me that stuff don't happen in, in, in the church. It happens. It does happen too much. It happens in the church. There's a, I'll tell you something that, that happens that really slicks in pretty quickly, and it's not... Um, because I've, I've, I've had it happen to me a couple of times, so I know it has to happen to more people than just me, is when you start to get this sense of security, you know, the sense that everything's going okay. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then what happens? You start getting a little loose with your money, getting a little loose with buying, spending stuff, doing that. Next thing you know, you're kind of caught up in your surroundings, and then the surroundings have got you. Because yeah. now you've stepped out too far where God maybe didn't say for you to go, and next thing you know, those things got you. How am I going to pay for this? I should have waited. I wish I hadn't done this. Am I right? That's a false sense of security that the devil is selling his people. Amen? I don't have to look too far to see that the all the surroundings are they're perilous. I mean, there's the world tells us that the surroundings, they, that these surroundings should dictate to us our response. The surroundings, they dictate our response. But God tells us that our response dictates our surroundings. Now let me, I'm going to have to say that again. I'm going to say it slow. <laughs> there it goes. The world tells us that our surroundings, the world tells us that our surroundings dictate our response. And I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about humans. It could be us. But God tells us this is what God says. God tells us our response dictates our surroundings. We should, we should be responding to our circumstances in such a way that is worldly. The world way of doing things. Every time we turn around, we're doing it the way the world does it. Now, don't get me wrong. The world has tapped into actually godly principles in a lot of ways. A lot of things people don't realize. You see a guy getting on top of his game or something, he's doing a lot going for him. I can assure you he's applying a principle that's already established in the kingdom of God. God says, God is not mocked. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. God's not mocked whatsoever a man. He didn't say Christian. Whatsoever man sows, that's what he'll reap. There's a lot of good people that don't know Jesus that are sowing good things, mm -hmm. but good things aren't going to get you in the kingdom of God. Amen. But they will receive yeah. the sowing part of what the kingdom of God principle is applied for in every one of us. Doesn't matter whether you're saved or not saved. There are certain principles that you can you can uh, you can operate in regardless. You may have been uh, uh, an alcoholic all your life, but when you respond to the Spirit of God. God will change your surroundings. Amen? Now, there's people in the church that, that um, I, I, I'm going to be real frank with you. I don't have a problem with someone having a beer or having a glass of wine or something. I don't have a big problem with that. 
Now, I don't know what the overall church might think about it or what, or what some people might think about it, but what I do have a problem with is if that, if that beer or that wine or, or smoking that dope or taking those pills or taking those prescription pills or taking those legal prescriptions, you know, if those things have you. That's, good. that's what, that's what, and I'm not, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm just here to stir this thing up a little bit in you, okay? God will change your surroundings. You, you said, I don't know about you, but it, my surroundings got changed when we decided to go through this 21-day Daniel fast. And I found myself wanting to do the things I was been doing, but I couldn't do them because I decided I was going to fast and I was going to uh, stick with it. And Jackie got all bent out of shape because she thought the week before, I get to have coffee. And I tried to count it up and I said, no, you don't. And she had already got all geared up for it. So yeah. your flesh was like, I'm ready to have a cup of coffee. We didn't drink any coffee. We didn't drink any of the caffeine. And she was, well, why didn't you tell me? I mean, she was disappointed. <laughs> well, you could count the calendar, Jackie. I thought you knew. I didn't know you didn't know. But she, she, she managed to put that flesh down and just and move forward with it. Amen. Amen. And see, God's going to, he's going to find things that, let me just say this, I'm sorry, he's going to find, but God's going to reveal things to you that he's been speaking to you about. Tell me, I'm wrong. I don't think I am. That he's speaking to you about that you're going to need to, you're going to need to hear what he's wanting you to do, and he's really wanting you to tighten it up. I mean, that's just, he's wanting you to tighten it up. He wants you to, because here's what's going to happen. If you don't, your surroundings will overtake you, just like it did with those guys in Ephraim. Do you know that uh, if you look up the meaning of the name Ephraim, the place where they had the battle, that I, I found the meaning, you know what the meaning is? Most people don't. I didn't either. I looked it up. Increasing. Wow. Did he know? Oh, I got like, yeah. Oh, okay, I got <laughs> Increasing. Ever growing and enlarging itself. <laughs> that can't be your belly. It's a care. Well, that's what happens when you start looking at the surroundings and you let them overtake you. You know? You see? I believe God's speaking to you right now. Amen, amen. Ever growing and enlarging itself. That could speak to all of us. Now I want to ask you uh, to uh, let your mind kind of compare this, this Bible, uh, about the Bible, what the Bible says about between heaven and hell. <clears throat> you, you know that, right? Heaven and hell? The Bible speaks of heaven as being a place of boundary, kind of. It has, uh, in Revelation 21 and 22, I don't know that I have that in there. I don't think I have that in there, but I don't have it in I know I don't. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's, it's as, as, a being, as being 1,500 miles square. Um, that's Revelation 21 22, or 22. And the way they come up with that is that it talk, talks about furlongs, and that's, so it's 12,000 furlongs. A furlong is an eighth of a mile. I got all the math on this. Look it up. Uh, this makes the, the city about 1,500 miles square or 1,500 miles in all directions. Now, that's a pretty good size uh, uh, area, but I, I, don't, I don't want to say that that's it. I'm just saying that's kind of what the thought is, and I can't say that, uh, that I would say that that's a fact. I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to say that if you read the Scriptures, you can take it that way, but I believe that God has something even more involved in that. And sometimes we might not know everything. We kind of live in mystery sometimes until we get to go see me with Jesus, okay? There's going to be some certain amount of mystery. And so it, but, but it speaks of boundaries, whether that's the right thing or not. But in Isaiah 15, 14, it speaks of hell as having enlarged. Isaiah 15, 14, it says, having enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Wow. Now, see, you, you see what, I, what, the, the, what the analogy here is that I'm trying to show you is that Heaven's got some boundaries, and hell is just keeps enlarging, opening its mouth, and there is no measure. It's it, it's it's going on, 
And so that tells that heaven has boundaries. Uh, in order to go to hell, you don't have to live by any guidelines. Um, you can do nothing and go to hell. You can not do any bad things and still go to hell. You can do all kinds of good things and still go to heaven. But in order, to have, in order to get into heaven, there are a few guidelines that you have to obey. A few guidelines. See, I want you to realize, see, a lot of people, they're, they're not out there trying to come against God or go with God. They're caught up in their surroundings. These guidelines that I'm talking about were given in Acts, Acts 2.38. Repent and Repent, this is the guidelines. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. See, the devil, he's, he's, he's flooding our society with more and more things that can get us caught up in the world. And so, in Isaiah 59, 19, it says, Isaiah 59, 19, it says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. See, the enemy is going to come in like a flood. He's going to try to come in. Yeah. And, I, and, you, and sometimes you can look around and it does look overwhelming. The odds don't look in our favor at times yeah. if you're a Christian. But I can tell you this. It don't matter he, if it takes... <laughs> It took one little kid named David to kill mm -hmm. off the Philistines. Right, yeah. One little take down the giant. Mm -hmm. God says he will raise up a standard against us. Mm -hmm. Against him. I, I kind of feel like the, like the devil has uh, changed his method in this, uh, in this generation. He's changed his method of way of going after people. See, back in the older days, it was pretty... Black and white, you kind of seen it, you know. If somebody was cheating on on a uh, uh, on his on on uh, on his wife, society as a whole just looked, hey, that's not right. That's right. Good. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you know, if you see the wife one stepping out and seeing another man, that's like, ooh. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you spotted him with them. That there, there's there's going to be some. There's definitely going to be some talk. That's right. And it was pretty blatant. Nowadays we. We don't think anything about it. I don't think anything about it. It happens in the church. It happens in the. It happens out there in the, in the world. I think he's he's changing his method. He's not he's not blatantly trying to just pull us into hell anymore. I don't. I just don't see it. He's not blatantly. You know, it's not obvious. He's just trying to make you us forget about hell, <laughs> and forget all about God. It's just nothing there. He knows that if he can blind us by our surroundings, that's exactly right. We'll not recognize our need for God. We won't recognize it. We're all about what's going on in our surroundings. As soon as we leave here, we're in the surroundings. As soon as we leave these buildings, we're in the surroundings. Am I right? Yes. Yes. See, he's trying to flood our minds so that we cannot be conscious of our need for God with all our surroundings. It's like the old saying, you can't see the you can't see the forest for the trees. Have you heard that one? Yeah. I mean they're right there, but you're looking for the whole forest. They're right there. The, tree, the trees are in the way. I can't see the forest. Well, Satan wants us not to uh, to be able to see help. He doesn't want us to see help. Because we're blinded by our surroundings. That's just a, a fact. But we do have consolation here. Or we have a choice. For the Word of God says that we're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're in it, and we have to occupy it until He comes. But we need to, we need to look at our surroundings trying to occupy in us. Go to Romans 12, 2. This is a, uh, this is a scripture that I want to read it. And I don't know, did, did we put it in an amplified too? Okay, but we're right now we're going to read it in the regular, okay? 
And it says, And do not be conformed to this world. I want you to hear this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means we've got to get our mind right according to the Word of God, train ourselves up to believe what the Word of God is, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is... Now listen, he's saying if you get in the Word, if you get your mind renewed by the Word of God, that he says that you may prove, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're going to be able to prove what God's will is for your life. It's acceptable to God. If you get in the Word and you start thinking like God says for you to think, that you're going to be able to be in these surroundings, but not be of these surroundings, okay? Now, in the Amplified, bam, this is what I like the Amplified too. Is this the Amplified? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's not. Yeah. Is it? Oh, is it going to have more? Okay, gotcha. Okay, and the Amplified says, and do not conform to this world. We just read that, right? And then here we go, little print brackets here. It says, any longer with its, its superficial values and customs. Did you hear that? Yes. Any longer with its superficial values and custom, but be transformed and progressively changed. See, progressively changed means it's going to be gradually changed. You're going to, it's not going to be all of, a sudden, all of a sudden. You're not just all of a sudden going to be changed. It's going to be a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And see, God can work with that. God, I, want you to, I want you to hear me now. God can work with that little bit. It's, it's, if you'll just give him a little bit, he'll start to work with that. Because see, if you try to give it all, it's like, man, it ain't happening. I ain't doing that. That didn't happen. I ain't giving up all that. So just give up a little bit and then let God work that bit and then pretty soon he'll start working so much and you'll want to give up a little more. Am I right? That doesn't mean you can't take it out completely. Because I mean, I remember when I used to cuss all the time. I mean, I mean, cuss up a storm. I thought that was what you were supposed to do when you hit the job site. And a matter of fact, you look for the guy, the boss man, and you look for the boss man, and he, if, he was, if, they, if somebody was cussing over that was probably the boss man. He was a straw dog. He was. And um, I, I didn't even think about trying to give up cussing. It never entered my mind to try to give up cussing. And then all of a sudden, my instructor, Jay, that took me in and mentored me, we were in the karate and all that stuff. He says, and I know I've told you this, but some of you know me. You haven't heard it, and it's worth hearing again. Because I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> so he comes to me and he says, Jack, we're going to stop cussing. And I said, oh, really? I'm thinking, now, what because you know, he's always trying to get us to do things to, that, that hurt you kind of. You know what I'm saying? When I say hurt, I mean like, you, you go out in the snow barefooted and you're cutting and you're, and you're, and you're chopping wood up and you're beating it up and you're, and you're you know, just... And windows down, freezing, and you're driving, and you're trying, you know, you're trying to get past that, you don't, you know, old mind over matter type deal. So I'm thinking, okay, this is another thing we're getting ready to do. Okay, so also we're stopping cussing. Okay, and I said, all right, that's not like the plan. He said, let me tell you why I'm going to going to stop cussing, Jack. I didn't find this out till several years later, where he came up with it, but his mama had told him this. He said, that's just a forceful way of expressing yourself in an illiterate manner. And I heard that. That's just a forceful way of expressing yourself in an illiterate manner. And so, ignorant made the audible. Okay. So, here's the deal. He, he told me we were going to stop, and I was trying to figure out how we were going to do that. And he told me, he said, Jack, here's how we're going to do it. If you say a cuss word, I'm going to smack the dogs to me out of here. <laughs> And I said, really? <laughs> yeah. I said, oh, okay. Well, let me ask you something. If I hear you cuss, am I going to be able to smack the dog shit out of you? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. I said, let's get it on. <laughs> uh, let's do it. About two weeks into that, we decided to go back to cussing. <laughs> we beat the dog shit out of each other. And it was like, that ain't happening. This ain't happening. So I continued to cuss till I got saved. I got saved. <laughs> done. So even if you try to give a little bit, it could go a little bit, but I'm saying to you that God can take not just the right, it can be a little bit and he'll work with you or it can be just like that. 
My daughter right there, she's never, have you ever heard me cuss? How old are you? 38. How old's, how old's my oldest daughter? 40. One. 41. She's never heard me cuss. That's not because there's anything good about me. It's not because, because if I could have done it, I would have done it. I wouldn't have got the dog suit beat out of me. I just couldn't do it. So see, there's going to be things in you that you're going to look at and you're going to say, I, I, just, I just don't think I can do it. Yes, you can. With, with God, all things are possible. Amen? So, let's read this in the Amplified. It says, And do not be conformed to this world and roll on any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually. You see that? As you mature spiritually. You're going to be transformed changed as you start to mature. Mature means you're growing up into a mature man and woman of God. By the renewing, this is how you get mature, by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourself, prove who? For yourself. What the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for you. That's a good scripture, isn't it? Amen. See, I may have to live in these surroundings, but that's just temporary right now. For one day, I'm going to be in the real home. You know, my, my, we're doing some stuff about selling a house and stuff, and I don't really want to leave the house, but I'm looking at what God I said, I'm trusting God just like, like I'm asking you to trust God. I don't want to sell my house, period. But I promised my wife that if I didn't have it paid off by a certain, certain time, I'd put it up for sale. It hasn't been paid off by that time now, and I'm... I'm still believing God all the way to the end until somebody puts it in my bank account. I'm still trusting God that I'm going to be able to stay in my house. But we'll see. We'll go. See, so I'm not wanting to do it. I, this, is how, this is how I do God. I just kind of go out there and say, hey, Father, you know, you know, you know, you know, I'm not trying to say anything that you don't already know. I'm just telling you my heart. I, my desire is I want to stay in my house. I don't like my house. I like my house. And so, and so I, I just... I, I, I say, but I want to trust you. I want to trust you. You know my heart. But I don't want to mess up. I don't want to do something wrong just because I, that's my desire. Just because it's my desire, don't make it right. Okay? So we're going to have to just trust you, Father. I'm going to trust you regardless what takes place. Because I'm going to be able to look back and say, I'm so glad we sold that house. Or I'm going to say, I told you we should have kept that house. <laughs> We, we win. And that's what I, I always win. I never lose. I never lose. I always win. Satan try to open the floodgates and saturate my mind if he wants to, but I have a, a promise that when the enemy tries to come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Amen? It's God's spirit that is going to be in us. It's, that's who we're looking. He's going to be. He's going to bring us out of these surroundings that we're talking about. You, you won't be able to do it yourself. That's why I tried to give you an example. You can't. Don't think you're going to be able to make this happen. It's not going to happen on your own. Uh, one day I'll get to it. That one day is going to be too late. If you don't do it according to the Word of God, renew your mind in the Word of God, become mature, spiritual, understanding Christians of the Word of God then you're going to have a hard time coming out of those surroundings of this life. Amen? I don't care what your surroundings are. God wants to bring you out of them this very day. I'm, I'm talking to you now. I don't really care about what your surroundings are. God wants to bring you out of them right now. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he preached to people who were blinded by their surroundings and their traditions. See, I mean, I've heard this all a lot. You know, this Springfield used to be like this. You know, the church used to do this. Used to, uh, okay. That's done. Exactly. It's done. It's what it is now. It's where it is now. For whatever reason, we're here. Praise God, we're here. His purpose and, and, and is for us to be able to Respond to him in such a way that, like in Acts two, uh, two forty, go to there. Acts two forty, uh, not there, not there. Acts two forty, and did I give you Acts two forty? Okay, there we go. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, "Save yourself from this 
perverse generation. Untoward gender, untoward that means perverse. Amen. So when I heard read that and I said, save yourself, my first regulation on that is there ain't no way you can save yourself. What does that mean? It's, a, it's, it's not possible to save ourselves. Jesus is the only one that could, could pay the price for salvation. Is that right? Yeah. So Peter wasn't really saying that then. I don't think Peter was really saying that save yourself. He was saying, you know, save yourself, that we are to pay a price for our own salvation. He wasn't saying that. What he would, we can't pay a price for our own salvation. Jesus paid that price. He was saying in order to be saved, you've got to respond to what Jesus has done for you. Amen? That's the only way you're going to be able to save yourself is for us, you have to make a choice to respond. So God wants to bring someone out of their surroundings this day. That means you're going to have to respond. Yeah. That's, you're going to have to respond. Respond. But you're going to be caught up with these surroundings and you're going to be lost. And then you will know the difference between heaven and hell. So you've got to save yourself by responding to God. The battle is on. Save yourself. Amen. That was the title. I'm going to ask you. Search your heart out. Close off what's going around you. And for just a minute, everybody close their eyes. Think about your surroundings. Think about the things that encompass you all the time. Think about the, the things you know you should be doing and you're not doing. I'm not here to condemn you by no means. That's not, my, that's not what I'm about. I don't like condemn that. That's the enemy. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to condemn you. The Holy Spirit wants to convict you. He wants to convict you. That's a difference. He wants to show you this, this is what's going on. The enemy wants to show you how bad you are so that way you, you'll be able to keep doing what you're doing and go to hell. That's not what I want. That's not what God wants. So I'm asking you right now, open up your heart, open up your mind, Allow your mouth to speak these words. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that God is His Father. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. That I might be able to go to heaven. And the only way I can do that is to say I'm sorry for my sins. Even the ones I don't know about. He said he is faithful. He's just to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness that we might be saved. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I am saved. In Jesus' name.